Amen. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father God, I'm up here right now, and I don't really know what to say. I'm looking around and I'm, I'm seeing a lot of pain, a lot of heartache. There's a lot going on here, Lord, and it's overwhelming me right now, and I just don't know what to say. So, I'm calling upon you right now to speak your words, to speak through myself and my mom. As we pray to you today, Lord, that you are here. We know that the Bible says where two or more are gathered, you are present. So we call upon you right now to enter this civic center right now with everything that's going on, with all the spiritual forces and the darkness that's all around here, Lord. We pray that your mighty power shine upon this civic center right now. With every believer, with every Christian that's here today, that's hearing my voice, God, I pray you call upon them to rise up and to preach your word mightily and boldly to everybody that needs to hear it. Everyone needs to hear it, Lord Jesus. So God, as we continue with this message, Lord, again, not my words, but your words, Lord. Speak through me. I am a vessel right now for your words. I'm a conduit right now for your words to be Amen. delivered. So, God, I pray that happens right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So, last week it was raining. And uh, I was a little disheartened because we were in, in the parking lot down the stairs over there. And not, anybody, not many people knew where we were. Oh. Um, so... Uh, just to announce, if it does rain again, we'll either be here where there's uh, uh, awnings and canopies, or we'll probably be in that parking lot. Either way, if you don't see us, we're over there. So, you know, our ministry is a, is a come rain or shine. We're always going to be here because we believe that with the power of consistency uh, and a weekly uh, church type of atmosphere, that's where we start to develop relationship with you guys, and that's what we believe Jesus wants us to do. So we're going to be here every week as long as we can. We're not just a fly-by-night ministry that comes in here once a year. We're here every week because that's yeah. the best gift we can give you guys is Amen. to have a church for you guys here every week. Also, we want to help you with your immediate needs. Some of you here are in need of a shelter, in need of uh, medical assistance, in need of clothing. We have resources on the back. You see Nick, he's wearing the green shirt. He's there to help you with any of those things. He also works for Goodwill, so he can help you get connected with some of Goodwill services. We also have jobs. Uh, Nancy, who's who's uh, usually here, she's not here today. Uh, there's actually a green sheet on the back that has some uh, local jobs for you guys to help uh, uh, take advantage of. And it's local, Santa Ana, McDonald. Some of the places are hiring right now. So before you leave and you're looking for it, come and see Nick and, and grab one of those job leads. Also, we just bought back the prayer cards. If you guys uh, have the prayer cards, I mean, does anybody have it? It's the yellow sheets. Uh, uh, Chrissy, or Nick, can you hold up the yellow, the yellow prayer cards? You'll see them in the back. A lot of you have come here with a heavy heart or you really are in need of prayer. We don't, want to, we don't want you guys to leave here without getting prayer. So feel free to grab one of those, write those out, and put it in the little heart box. It's a new heart box that my mom grabbed today. And we'll be praying for those. Those prayer boxes, everything in there is confidential, so we're not going to share it. It's just uh, I'll be praying for the men. Uh, my mom will be praying for the women. So if you pull out your message notes, you're going to see there's a, uh, the message of today is titled, Good People, Good Progress. Good people, good progress. We're going to look at those two topics today. Good people, what that looks like to have good people in your life, how important that is, and how we can have good progress without perfection, without being perfectionists. So if you look at your message notes, it'll say principle five. I voluntarily submit to every change God wants to make in my life, and I humbly ask him to remove my character defects. We all have character <laughs> defects. We all of us. Nobody that's walking the face of the earth uh, does not have character defects. Nobody's perfect. We all have areas to improve. Areas that we need to grow in. Areas that God wants to change. And in order to change, we have to voluntarily submit to that change that God wants to make in our lives. And one of the best ways to do that, the way to do that, is to, is to basically be humble enough to say that every single morning you wake mm -hmm. up. And say, God, I have character defects today. 
God, I'm not perfect today. God, I'm going to sin today. I know it. But I know I'll never be sinless. But I know that with your power, I can sin less. And every day we must commit to that commitment, to allowing God to remove our character defects, one defect at a time. And the Bible says in Matthew 5, 6, happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. A lot of us don't know what God wants for us. A lot of us don't know what God's purposes for our lives are. A lot of us don't even know why we're here, that we actually do indeed have a purpose. If you're breathing right now, you have a purpose. You're born with a purpose. God designed you for a purpose. And to be willing to, to honor God with your life and, to, and have it be your greatest desire, not down the list of priorities, but your greatest desire, your greatest number one priority is to do what God requires for your life, then you will be happy. It's a formula for success. It's a formula for happiness. And that's what God wants for you. And it's easy to say, okay, God, I'm going to give you my life. Okay, God, I'm going to, I'm going to do what you want. It's easy to say that, but it's another thing to do it. It's where the rubber meets the road. It's where our actions speak louder than our words. We don't always have to proclaim all the time that we're going to be doing what God wants us to do. But when we just every day wake up and say, God, I'm going to do it humbly. I'm going to follow your will. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray to you continually. I'm going to come to you with every decision that I have and pray to you. When we can make a commitment to do what God requires for us for that day, we'll live a much more joyous day. Amen. So if you look at making changes, the transformation choice, this is the, the particular choice we're at right now, the transformation choice, how to transform, you know, the, especially now at times of the year, everybody wants to change. They want to change jobs. They want to change their body. They want to change their financial situation. They may even want to change their relationships, right? They're thinking, okay, it's a new year. I want to have a new me and I want to change. Right. Here's some points that, that uh, we have on your notes in order to have that spiritual change that God wants us to make. The first thing we have to admit is that God has forgiven us. We may have not accepted that forgiveness yet, but God is ready and willing to Forgiving forgive you God. for our sins. Amen. And like I said, we've all sinned. Whether it be yesterday, whether it be today, last week, we've all sinned. Everybody sins continually. And as we sin, we're constantly drifting farther and farther and farther away from God. And that sin becomes a barrier uh, for, our, for us and for our relationship with God. But why did Jesus die on the cross? He died on the cross to make it available to us that whatever sins that we commit in this life, that we are available to God if we humbly come to him and ask for forgiveness. That's, that's what Christ did. That's what it's all about. But it says, now he wants you to start working on your character defects. Okay. Amen. It's one thing to accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, right? There's power in Jesus. There's no power within, like we, you know, say in self-help books. I, I, I. There's not an I. There's no power in I. There's power in Jesus. That's why uh, Celebrate Recovery, this, pro this series that we're, we're basically basing this off of, uh, you know, it's different than AA, you know? They talk about higher power. The higher power can be that tree right there. A Anybody doorknob. that's an AA. But is there power in that tree? Absolutely no. not. You probably can get some wood, probably can recycle mm -hmm. some paper. The real power for change comes from God. Amen. And when you, when, when you gotta basically say it the way it is. Higher power comes from Jesus Christ. Amen. No, Nowhere else. Nowhere else. It doesn't come from within. A lot of us wish it did. Trust me, I tried that approach. It did not work. Mm -hmm. no. But once you've accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, the next step is to allow God to use you, to become more and more like Christ. And this is a lifelong process. For the rest of your life, once you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then the rest of your life will be becoming more and more like Christ. And the way to do that is to allow God to work on your character defects. Character defects are like areas that God wants to chip away, to remove from your life. And some of us, we have so many. And it's going to take a lifelong process for us to become more and more and more like Christ. And we're never going to arrive. It's always going to be a struggle. We're always going to have areas that God wants to improve because we're never going to arrive. So that's why a lot of people that are in recovery, even though they have 11 years of sobriety, 20 years of sobriety, 
they've still made that commitment to continue to go to the meetings, celebrate recovery meetings, because they know that for the rest of their life, they're always going to struggle. And the moment they start to get complacent and drop their guard and miss their meetings Whoa. is the moment they start to Amen. work towards relapsing. Yes. And they don't want to relapse because so they true. know that they need to always change. And there's always an area that they need to improve. Amen. So again, change requires commitment. And to commit, you have to prioritize that change in your life. It has to be above everything else. Just like it says in Matthew 5, 6, the greatest desire is to do what God requires. If your greatest desire is to do what God requires and you mean it and your actions follow it, then you will change. Whatever change in your life you wanna make, whether it be a financial, whether it be relational, whether it be health change, spiritual health change, emotional health change, whatever change that you really need in your life, you wanna change, you gotta make it a top priority. There's no way around it. You have to make it a top priority. It's not something we fall into or we just say, okay, it's gonna eventually come in time. No, it doesn't come in time. You know how it comes? The investment that you make into changing one day at a time, over time, you will start to see the change. But it has to be a daily commitment. In other words, if you want to change the way you live, you must change the way you think. Our world will tell you that if you look a certain way, dress a certain way, drive a certain kind of car, have a certain title on your business card, have a certain diploma or degree or whatever it is. Worldly. A worldly uh, a status of some sort. The world will tell you that you have arrived that you are okay, right? And so we try to focus on the exterior to change mm. and it doesn't work. It's just putting on a mask. Mm -hmm. And when you put on that mask, we're living a lie. Materialistic. There's a lot of people that appear to have everything, but they are living a lie because they are not focusing on the inside change. Mm -hmm. Change is from the inside out. If you wanna change, you have to start with the heart. You have to start from the inside, not the outside. We can change our cosmetics. We can change our attire. I can get all the muscles in the world, and that's not going to change the, the brokenness that's in my heart. And if I want to live the life that God wants me to live and be the man that God wants me to be, I have to focus on here, and I have to take this very, very seriously. Amen. The Bible says in Romans 12 too, let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. It starts from within. It starts from the heart and the mind. So we've been talking for the past couple weeks about how to apply Romans 12 to, to, into our lives. Areas that we need to focus. And I'm going to give you guys a quick recap of what we've been talking about the past couple of weeks. The first area we need to focus on is one defect at a time, one character defect at a time. Many of us go into recovery and we're overwhelmed because we struggle with so many things and it's so overwhelming that we just give up. I, I can't, I can't, I'm, I'm a mess, I can't do it. It's okay not to be okay. But how you do it is you focus on one character defect at a time. For me, I, I talked about my men's group, you know, the, the lusting the, the desires that I have. That's why I'm in my step study right now. And then the next time I do a step study, I'm going to focus on anger, my anger issues, right? One character defect at a time. And then the, the next thing is one day at a time. Change happens one day at a time. You know, I asked this one guy who had many years of sobriety and he said, I'm like, how do, how do you get sobriety? And he's like, you know, I just focus on that day. I can't promise about tomorrow. I may relapse tomorrow. Right. But when I wake up tomorrow, I'm going to promise or I'm going to, I'm going to stay close to God and commit to staying sober that day. But all you could do is focus on one day at a time because the Bible says we need to only focus on that day. Don't go past that day. And I'm not saying don't plan, but what I'm saying is in terms of change, you gotta give yourself grace. You gotta allow the process to take place and be very patient with yourself and make that change one day at a time. That's all we can handle, right? And then the third one is focusing on God's power, not our own power. It's very easy in recovery to want to focus on our own power, but it only lasts so long. I, I use that Energizer Bunny. Yeah. You know, that's a lie. It, keeps, it doesn't keep going and going and going. You know, the, the media, everybody will tell you that you can do anything you want. It doesn't work. It's a lie. If it's God's will for your life and you put him first, 
you'll see what he'll do in your life. And there's so much power in God's power. The problem is we haven't tapped into it. You know, one of my friends, one of my good friends, who actually just became born again, turned his life over to Christ uh, a, couple, or a couple months ago, he told me that somebody had taught him that when we're born, we're, in, we're immediately disconnected from God. As soon as we're born, we're disconnected from God. So our lives are just trying to get connected to God. And that might take us many years, many decades, or it may take us really short, you know, however, you know, depending on the parents we have. But it's a struggle to learn on how to plug in to God's power and to get connected with Him. And for some of us, that's where we're at. We're just simply trying to get plugged into God's power. We're trying to get plugged into God and have a relationship with Him. Satan does not want you to get plugged in. He, he didn't want it when you were born, and he doesn't want it now. Or maybe you were plugged in, and he wants to unplug you from God's power because he knows exactly the devastation and the destruction that will come into your life when you are without God in your life. Can I get an amen? Amen. So then the fourth thing we looked at was we don't follow our feelings. We don't listen to our feelings because our feelings lie. We act our way past our feelings. And then eventually our feelings will catch up to our actions. An example of this could be, uh, I fell out of love with my spouse. I don't love him anymore. I don't love her anymore, right? And you fall out. And so you just follow your feelings. Well, I'm going to get divorced. Well, people that have taken this very seriously, they know that feelings lie. Feelings make them stray, even from God or from, you know, church or whatever. If you can act your way out of that feeling, eventually your feelings will catch up to your actions. So even though you may not feel loving towards your spouse, you can still act that way. You can still, with your actions, show love towards your spouse. Love is more of an action than it is a feeling. I'm not saying that love isn't a feeling. There is feelings involved in love, but it's more action than anything because love is selfless, not selfish. True love is selfless and not selfish. So that's the, that's the other point. And then the last one uh, was uh, last week we looked at focusing on what you're thinking about. How's your mind life like? How's your thought life like? What are you thinking about? What are you putting into your minds? You know, we take, we underestimate the power of, of input, mental input. Are you hearing things on a continual basis? Are you around people that are cursing a lot, right? Are you reading your Bible? What are you reading? What is, what, what, how are you spending your time? And what are some things that are going into your mind? If you can learn to examine that and maybe make some changes in that area, your thought life will eventually influence how you feel, which will influence how you act. So all this stuff is a matter of focus. What are you focusing on? And again, true change, inwardly transformation comes from a thought process, changing the way you think. So we have two more, two more areas that we need to focus on today. And these are areas that are extremely important. And if you want to change, if you want to recover, if maybe you want to overcome an addiction or a bad habit and you have difficulty overcoming it, then there's the enemy is going to come at you with two things. One, he doesn't want you to have healthy people in your life. And two, he wants you to be a perfectionist and get easily discouraged when you're not getting the change that you want. These are two areas in which I struggled with the most when I came into recovery. Two areas that I didn't do. I isolated and I was a perfectionist. And as a result, I drifted from the Celebrate Reco yes. Recovery Program for three wow. years. So, so I'm very passionate about these two areas because I know firsthand yes. what it feels like to not have that foundation, that recovery foundation that I needed to change. So I want you guys to take this very seriously as you move forward with this recovery process, with this change process. The first one is this, the first area here, is to focus on people who help me and not hinder me. If you want to change, you have to be very careful who you hang around. Yeah. You know, we may compromise, but God warns us very clearly, very clearly, that bad company corrupts good character. Amen. It's actually in 1 Corinthians 15, 33. This verse is so powerful and so important that we wrote it down in three different translations. If you look at your message notes, the first one is the, the NIV version. Bad company corrupts good character. You may have good character, but the company that you hang around will eventually have a negative influence on your life. The NCV translation said bad friends will ruin good habits. 
So you may have some good habits, you may read the Bible, but if you surround yourself with bad friends or friends that are unhealthy, that are pulling you down, it's very easy to drift away and to stop doing those habits. And then the other one is bad friends will destroy you. That's a little more blunt, right? In the CEV Straight version. Off. Bad friends can destroy you, yeah, if you allow it to happen. And for some of us, I mean, you may know, for some of us, we struggle with addictions. And our friends aren't helping us overcome it. Our friends aren't helping us uh, stop. Encourage. As a matter of fact, they're encouraging it. Or they're pushing us to do it. And when we, do, when, when we want to stop, they don't let us stop. They want us to be with them because they don't want to be alone in their struggles. So you have to take it seriously. This is a very serious verse for change. Satan will use people, unhealthy people, to stop you and to, and to, and to, and to cause you to want to relapse. Slade. You know, I, I'm a huge uh, MMA fan. I love UFC. I know Tim is in the back there. He's a, he's a big uh, Omar, too. Yeah. Nick, too. I got a lot, bunch of people. Johnny, you got a lot of tough guys here, man. Hey, stand up if you used to do some MMA. Johnny, go ahead, stand up. Look at all these guys. It's all, yeah, you got George. Man, uh, you guys are tough. I'm not going to mess with you guys. <laughs> you know what? It's funny I, what I learned about MMA. Because I, lo- I know it's a lot of fighters. I've seen a lot of fighters. I've followed their careers over the past decade. And sometimes when a fighter's career gets stagnant or they start to lose their fight or they maybe lost the, the belt and they're really struggling with identity, they're struggling with, you know what, I don't know if I'm going to continue on. What they do is they change camps. They change camps. Camps that will help challenge them. They look at their weaknesses and say, you know what, if I join these guys who really specialize and are really good at maybe jujitsu or or Muay Thai or whatever it may be that that individual's weak at, they're gonna join that camp so they can strengthen their game. They're gonna focus on their weaknesses and they're going to be better as fighters. But they can't do it by watching YouTube videos. I tried. I tried to learn submission moves by watching YouTube. You gotta spar. No, it you gotta spar. You gotta have somebody to practice the moves on. You need people and you need an instructor. You need somebody who's gonna coach you, who's gonna help you through it. And I use that analogy because we're all in a fight. We're all in a battle. All of us. Satan is coming at you every single day. And we are unprepared on how to fight that battle. And one of the tools that God gives us is God people. And if we pray it, if we want it, if we really want it bad enough, and we really prioritize having healthy people that will build us up and not tear us down, then God will provide it. I prayed for it, I got it. I have wonderful men in my life. I have the Iron Men that are here uh, today, and I also have uh, men, accountability partners, um, sponsors in my Celebrate Recovery program that are helping me stay sober. And I've relapsed, I'll, I'll, con- I'll be- confess. I've had, for the past six years, I've struggled with relapsing. But I have had these men to bring me back on track and to help me get back on the recovery path that God wants me to be on. Amen, yeah. And it says the bullets, if you don't want to get stung, stay away from the bees. If you don't want to get stung, stay away from the bees. Sometimes the bees are attractive. Oh, okay, maybe I'll find some honey there, right? You know what? We'll get stung. And many of us are allergic to the bees. And it really harms us physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So we need to really take this very seriously. One of the ways is you don't hang around places or people that will mess you up. People or places, and you know, there's things. some there's some places that may be a trigger for some people, right? Even seeing a beer can on a shelf could be a trigger for some people. Yep. Mm-hmm. Try to avoid those. If you're easily triggered, try to avoid those triggers. One small step of compromise is a small step towards relapse. And what I've learned about relapse is you take that small step, one compromise, the next step will be even bigger and even faster and even faster. Friends, I have relapsed within a matter of seconds from having a beautiful Christian moment where I'm praising God and I'm listening to Christian music to seconds later because I'm on the internet to relapse. Mm -hmm. That's how quick it could happen. It doesn't necessarily have to be that. It could be drugs, alcohol. You could be seeing a group of people and they say, hey, come. And it seems innocent. Oh, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to watch them do it, right? One small 
compromise leads to relapse. It's in the direction of relapse. So the best way to stay sober is to never take a step, even if it's small, towards relapse, towards acting out in some way, right? So the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12, it says two people are better than one for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Yeah, you isolate and you fall, it's really hard to get back up. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better. And for a triple braided cord, it's not easily broken. If you have a pen, a pen I want you to write down 1 Samuel chapter 14. It's a wonderful story about the son of King Saul. His name is Jonathan. Yeah. And they were going against the Philistines. They had more people in the Philistine army than they did the Israelites. So John, Jonathan, he felt he had this perhaps God moment. Well, perhaps God will help me with this. And he took this leap of faith. But his armor bearer was actually his friend. And he was loyal to him. And he had a, what's called a heart and soul moment, right? He followed him and believed in Jonathan, heart and soul. So the two of them went down and they killed 20 Philistines. And then God destroyed the rest, basically. But they took that leap of faith. Do you think Jonathan was supposed to do that by himself? No. Because it doesn't work that way. He had a friend. He had a loyal friend. Amen. Somebody who was going to encourage him and help him through it to face this battle. So my question for you guys is, what's your battle? And who do you need to bring into your life to fight it? You may have overwhelming odds. It may be so insurmountable, this enemy that you're trying to face. You have tried so many times to quit, whatever it may be, or your circumstances are so overwhelming, it's like a mountain. But what does it say in the Bible? All you need is faith, the size of a mustard seed, and you say, God, move the mountain, and he will move the mountain. What is your mountain? What is your mountain? We are better together. You know, I like the three little pigs story, right? How many of you guys have heard of three little oh, pigs yeah, stories? Oh, yeah, right? One house built of straw. Brick. The other house built of wood. Wood. And then the and other house built a brick. And as the big bad wolf, or quote unquote Satan, comes and tries to blow your house down, what happened is the pigs went into the other house. And then they blew down that house. With and then the he other. went into the to the, to the brick house. The interesting thing about this story, I was thinking about this on the way here today. I was thinking, if the pigs would have worked together to build a bigger house, they all could have lived in there, and they would have fought off, that none of them would have had their houses built down. Yeah. Because the straw house and the wood house took time to build. And so they wasted their time building that house because the enemy came in and destroyed it. They laid a foundation that was too weak for their lives to fend off Satan, right? If they would have worked together, they are better together, they could have built a three-story brick house. And the brick house guy, the one who's better at architecture than the other two, could have said, hey, I'm going to lead you guys because I know more about construction than you two, but you guys have to do what I say. And let me, let's build this three-story house, right? Maybe one of them can be the cooker, the cooking, you know, maybe the other one can do the landscaping, teamwork, whatever. Teamwork. But we all specialize in our certain things, so we are better together. They should have worked together. I'm going to rewrite the story where they're working together. And you know what would have happened? The Satan would have came and would have got frustrated and would have went down the road. <laughs> take a hike. Yeah, I like that story better. So you can't recover on your own. You can't do anything on your own. No. I mean, anything good for your life. You can't do it alone. Pick an area. Think about it. I want to get a job. Can't do it alone. I want to overcome this addiction. I can't do it alone. I, w I need help. I want to help to forgive this person, this, this family member. It's too, it's, I'm so much resentment. You can't do it alone. You need somebody to walk with you, pray with you for that. You can't get well without other people. And accountability is a tool that's used in Celebrate Recovery, that's used in AA, that's used in Narcotics Anonymous. They have accountability for a reason. And those individuals that take advantage of that tool of accountability are those individuals that see change in their lives. And they've learned the power of influence. Yes. Isolation is Satan's tool to defeat you. Isolation is Satan's tool to defeat you. Remember that. When you feel like you don't want to talk to anybody, 
you don't want to confess something, you want to just be alone, the moment you feel isolated, remember who's influencing you to do that. The enemy. Because he knows when you're by yourself, that's when it breeds all the bad habits that we do. And we must be in a relationship with Christ followers who want to see us succeed. Amen. It's much easier. It's much easier for somebody to pull you down than it is for somebody to pull sure you up. Is. Right? Amen. It's very easy to have somebody pull you down oh, than yeah. pull you up. So that's why we got to take this very seriously. What type of people do we have in our lives? Are they people that will pull us up or pull us down? Mm -hmm. So how we can apply this particular portion of the message today is we could take advantage of our men's and our women's open share group. This is very important to me, guys, to have you have the opportunity to have healthy people in your life, to have an opportunity to share in a safe place. Jenna is the leader of our women's open share. I am the leader of our men's open share. Do you guys see the shirt that I'm wearing? Amen. What is it? Awesome. What is this shirt? You guys know what it is? Iron Man. Iron Man, that's right. I don't wear this shirt because I'm a huge Marvels fan. Well, I am. I am a huge Marvels fan. I see all the movies, by the way. But I am basing this, wearing this shirt, and the name of our men's group, which is Iron Men, off of Proverbs 27, 17. One of my most favorite verses. Yes. As iron sharpens iron. So a friend sharpens a friend. Friend, yes. Do you guys want to have an Iron Man or Iron Woman type of connection Iron sharpens life? iron. Do you want to allow yourself to be sharpened and be better through other people? Amen. If you do, stand up right now. Declare to God and declare to all those around you that you will take this very seriously. Iron Boy. sharpens iron is a commandment, but it's also a promise from God. When we connect ourselves with healthy people, we will start to get sharper and sharper. My mom's going to come up here and share a few things on this one. Amen. Let's hear it from my mom. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Let's hear it for Thank Chris. Thank you, Chris. I, um, I told Chris today that um, I wanted him to speak more because he has so many experiences and so much to share about this. But um, I have a lady here that's in my small group. She's got that cute little white hat on back there, Cindy. The she knows how um, I am always praying for this outreach, specifically the women. Amen. Specifically the women. And they can't be isolated. Iron men here, Christians, all of you that are here, be together. Oh, yeah. Because there's definitely Satan's thumbprint at the Civic Center. Amen. It's very obvious the pain, the mental disturbance, everything that is going on here. And it's very important that you Christians be the light and you stay close together. You cannot do it on your own. You cannot do it on your own. So the subject here was, um, can friends uh, p focus on people who help me, not hinder me? I also had another thought that's uh, a little bit off, but I noticed that there's all kinds of people, they come here weekly, all the time, and they're giving out stuff all the time. We're always getting stuff free here and all these things. And I think what's happening and I look at this and I pray and I pray and we just start to get reliant on that. And we don't look at 